Eyes or in for a rod. And where God has us right now is, um, Father, let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I just ask, Father, that uh, it would, uh, Lord, that you would open our ears and our hearts to receive you, Father. Lord, and our eyes to see you. And Lord, I just uh, I pray, Lord, I bind the enemy in Jesus' name in any kind of way, shape, or form that's trying to bring distraction to those that are here. Yeah. Lord, your word says whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever we loose will be loosed. So, Father, I ask, Lord, that you uh, loose your Holy Spirit upon all of us that are here. Yeah. Your bride, Father, uh, because it's all about you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Man, where we at right now, um, I wrote down a lot of information because I'm excited because I believe right now personally that God is getting his house in order. Yes. Because, you know, I'm expecting this Passover, springtime, a big move of the Spirit. Um, so there's a lot of confirmation that's going on right now, what God's doing and what he's speaking. But what God had placed in my heart and, you know, if we go, went back to last week real quick, you know, it's just about understanding the pattern and setting the pattern that God has laid up so we know what is the church, you know, what is the true church, what is not. And I'm not going to start pointing out what's not because the church is actually a body of believers that is everywhere, okay? I don't care where you're at, where you assemble or whatever it is, you know, God knows his children, God knows his bride. Because each and every one of us has to come to his door. Right. right? Remember the bridegroom came for the ten virgins. Five were ready, five were foolish. The five came and knocked on a the door. They ran out of oil. They wasn't wise. They didn't endure to the end. Right? Right. So we find out biblically. And I want to show you the mystery of the ages that was concealed from the very beginning was that it was all about God was going to take a bride for himself, not out of a nation. Yes, he did, the children of Israel, you know, through Abraham. But through Abraham, he said the nations would be blessed, Amen. that God was going to choose a bride from the nations, okay? Yeah. So it's all about a marriage. You are a bride. We're, the Bible says we're waiting for the bridegroom, right? Yeah. So what I want to do is, I want to take you back to the very beginning and show you God's pattern. So, you know, you are a tabernacle, a dwelling place. You are the body that Christ dwells in, right? So within you, you have to have these pieces set up in you because you're his house. And God's house is in order, right? Right. And the priest served in the house of the Lord. You guys are in for a treat today. Your eyes are going to be open to a lot. Good stuff. So watch this. Um, God set his house up a certain way, right? And y'all ready? Let's get started. Whew. You should have had your board today, son. Right. It's, it's, it's all good because I know I'm going to have to recap. I want to read something to you. My mom called me up this week. Just to show you, just the, she was reading her Bible, the parallel of what God's talking about right now. When I tell you the whole entire book is about a marriage, it's, yeah. it's, that's what a covenant is, right? Right. So, a binding agreement between two, by blood. And listen to this. Throughout Scripture, the marriage union is a metaphor or a picture of the relationship between God and His people. In the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant, it's not an Old Testament, Israel is pictured as the wife of Yahweh. When Israel became unfaithful and worshipped other gods, she was described as a harlot in Jeremiah 3.1 and in Ezekiel 23. Her spiritual adultery became so despicable in God's sight that he issued a writing of divorcement in Jeremiah 3.8. Wow. 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 Actually... This was a separation as God, in his great love for his chosen people, could not bear to cut out Israel without a promise of renewal. And that's what we find in Hosea. Though in Hosea was commanded to marry an unfaithful bride, a harlot. And, you know, through Hosea, whose name means Hoshua, which means Yeshua, which means Jesus. 
you see Jesus continually reaching out and delivering Hosea. So it's all about a marriage. In the epistle and in Revelations, the church is described as the bride of Christ. The experience of obtaining a bride is similar for both Adam and Christ. Listen to this. Pretty amazing stuff. Adam was put to sleep. Christ was laid in a tomb. When Christ came to earth in human form, he left his father. Right? When he began his earthly ministry and ultimately died on a cross, he left his mother. That's why, biblically, you find out, and I told this to John last night, you know, it's all about a bride. When God created Adam and Eve in the beginning, he gave this word. He said, this is why a man ought to leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become joined, one flesh. Wow, joined. Pretty amazing word. We're going to hit it in a minute. Jesus left his father because it's a picture. Remember I told you that the first Adam and his wife was a picture of the second Adam and his wife. Y'all with me there? So when he said this is the reason uh, 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 that you know a man is to leave his father and his mother. He began his ministry at 30 and left his mom. Right? He had to do go about his business for his bride. That's what he's, you know working for. He's looking for a bride. That's right. Right? The Spirit's going to bring it to him. And they got all kind of, you know, metaphors in the Bible about it. But it says that Jesus left his father, leave your father and your mother, and cling to your wife. That's what it's about. That's yeah. the whole metaphor. Wow. Right. So, he says, um, he ultimately died on the cross. This was the purpose of cleaving to the object of his love, his people. And he is received into the heart of each sinner. They become one flesh as we receive him. That's why when a man and a woman gets married, you know, my wife took on Shawbit, my name. Right? Right. Because she cleaved unto me. We became one flesh. She took my name. You get married to Jesus Christ. You know, you become Christians. You take upon His name, His ministry, what He's called you to do to serve Him in His house, right? Right. He, he sets the house up, the bride works in it, right? That's right. That's exact. I'm a bride. You a bride. We both have the same job. I'm working, and this is His house. I'm, and what that means is, not this building, I am working in your house. Your house is the house of God. That's right. I am setting up things in your house. That's why Paul said, be careful, therefore, who builds upon your foundation. That's right. Wood, hay, and stubble is all going to pass through the fire. But gold, silver, and precious stones will pass through it, and that's what I'm building in you. Because you and me, both of us, have been called to serve one another. Amen. I work in your house, you work in my house. I physically will come by your house and work, and you will physically come by my house and work. But when we come together, we spiritually work in each other's house using the gifts that God has given us. Amen. Right. right. So that God can move, his house can have order, his pieces are set up like they're supposed to be. That's what it's about. So... The whole focus of the course of our life is changed both by marriage and a personal experience with Jesus Christ. The whole focus and course of our life is changed yeah. when you come to meet Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's no longer about you. It's about your head, Christ Jesus, and what He's now called you and I to do. Number one, first, to come into relationship with Him. To know Him. To see who He is and what He's about. Right? Every wife in here, whether, you know, divorced or not divorced or whatever it is, every wife knows what their husband likes. Yes. Right? So, you have to know what it is that our husband, Jesus, the bridegroom, likes. I'm a bride. You're a bride. You come into, I come into intimacy with my wife. She produces children. 
you come into intimacy with Jesus Christ, you produce spiritual children. That's right. He impregnates you with the Word. Yes. You can't help but tell people about it. That's right. Then you begin as a bride to bring forth children. Yes. A bride that doesn't bring forth children is barren. That's right. Man. That's not, you know, and that was like a disgrace to them back then. Hannah praying at the temple. Give me a son, please, and I'll give him to you. Watch this. Man, we're going to get into some stuff today, son. We're going to see the pattern that God has laid out for you and me. He says, um... It says, let me go back, the whole focus of the course of our life is changed both by marriage and our personal experience with Jesus Christ. The marriage and becoming a child of God demand death to self and accountability to, uh, accountability to God and to others. A wife or a husband cannot be faithful to more than one partner. As a Christian cannot serve other gods. Believers should have no hesitation in giving themselves in totality to God because of the high price that He paid for them. God has given all He has to give. He now expects our all in response. Wow. Pretty amazing, right? In marriage, two hearts are grafted together, making them dependent upon one another for life. This is depicted in John 15, where Jesus says to the believers, I am the vine and ye are the branches. Through the infilling of the Holy Spirit and His control in uh, the life of both partners, the picture of the marriage and the parallel relationship of Christ and His bride come into focus. The Holy Spirit fills and fulfills us both. So when we realize that, number one, a man is not greater than a woman, nor is a woman greater than a man. It's just God has placed the woman under subjection under the man. We're both doing the same thing. I'm subject, subjected on... But then, when you're in Christ, then you're subjected one to, unto another. Right. So where are you at? Subjected. <laughs> you know, subjected. Now, let's get started. We're going to get, you know, we're going to get into the tabernacle. But we're going to go way beyond the tabernacle. Because before the tabernacle was even set up, before the altar and the laver and all the pieces that you see was set up, there was many altars and lavers before it. Many, many. So we want to gather what it is that God... Now remember, this is something that's set up in a house. This is outside the house. And these pieces right here or inside of the house. This is in your front yard, yeah. right? Yeah. This is inside your house. Worship can't happen out here. Worship only happens in here. In a holy place. That's it. You can't worship God out here in the flesh. You have to come in. When you come into His presence, He begins to reveal Himself to you. That's when true worship happens. True worship is worship Him in spirit and in truth. So let's, let's look at this. Why did God command Moses to build a tabernacle? Question. What was the requirements in building the tabernacle for the Lord? Let's read Exodus chapter 25, 1 through 9. It says... You guys, man, I am pumped about it, man. Exodus 25, 1 through 9. Exodus 25, 1 through 9. He says, uh, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. Right? A free will offering to build a house. Why? Because Christ laid down His life free willingly. Amen. He was the dwelling place of God. Amen. Amen. Anything that's going to be built for God has got to be of your own free will. Amen. Nobody can force you. Right. Right? Amen. Watch this. And this is the offering which you shall take 
This is the offering which you shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate. Watch them. Now, in verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God wants to dwell among you and I. That's right. He wants to dwell among you and I. So God, if your pieces are not in order, there's no dwelling in you. You understand that? There's no dwelling. But when we get our pieces in order, when the church is in order, God dwells amongst His people. That's His heart. Amen. You're going to find out what a sacrifice really is. It's not about getting your money. It's not about giving so you can get. He don't, it ain't like the deity. It isn't like God is demanding blood from you. He wants blood to appease Him. No. That isn't, that's not God. No. You're going to see what it is. Amazing stuff. I love verse 9. He says, verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so ye shall make it. Moses, a master, a master builder, a master craftsman, left, nothing is left to him for his imagination, oh, I'm going to build this to look like this. No, God says, build it according to the pattern. It's for a purpose. God told Noah, build the ark. 300 cubits by 90 cubits by 30 cubits. Three levels, acacia wood, you know, one door, a window above. He gave him specific orders in building it, this pattern. Because this is a pattern in, in, in the midst of how God is going to dwell with them. Every single pattern. It's the same pattern that's in the church. I don't know what board you are or what stone, right, in the temple or where you're actually positioned in his house, but you are a precious stone, a lively stone, a tabernacle, a temple of the most holy God. You fit someplace. That's why when you go to heaven, God gives you a new name written in stone that no man knows but you. Because you're part of that new holy city, Jerusalem. It's you. Your name is in it. Yeah. Wow. Yes. That's where the Lamb dwells. When I walk in, wow, look at Denise's name right there. It's her house. It's the bride's house. And the foundations, each foundation had the names of the apostles in it. Your name. When you get there, your name better be in it. Yeah. If it's not, you're in trouble. Amen. Listen. Mm. It, says, uh, it says, because Christ, um, the offering... Uh, that Moses received to build this tabernacle, God said it needs to be from a willing heart. Right. A free will offering. That's right. That's why the tithe part, laying this tithe on people, demanding them that they do this, do this, do this. You can't build God's house like that. You can't build it. When He returns... And he sets up his law and his kingdom again. The ties are reinstituted when the king is sitting on the throne. I know that might be a shock to someone, but anyway. God told Moses what to accept in building his house. So you can't build it like you want. God, there were specific orders. It would be a place for God that he may dwell among his people. God wants to dwell among you. He wants to come and visit you. Yes. But there's things in your life that might be prohibiting it. Yeah. Right? Right. God showed Moses exactly what the pattern of the tabernacle would be and left nothing up to him. In Exodus chapter 25 to 27, it speaks of the furniture pieces when God is setting this tabernacle up. 
that was placed inside the tabernacle of the Lord. They call it the tabernacle of Moses. Tabernacle means tent or dwelling place. It was the tabernacle of the Lord. It was, you know, Moses built it, but it was the tabernacle that God may dwell amongst the people. Also known as the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting, a meeting place where God can meet with his people. That's his heart. Tell Pharaoh to, tell my, to let my people go come three days that they may sacrifice. You know what that means? That means to be able to tell my people and let them come that they may sacrifice, that they may draw near unto me. Hallelujah. God wants you to draw near unto him. Amen. But you have to get your house in order. You have to get your house in order. Yes. If your house is not in order, no presence. That's right. No communion. A lot of people stay out there. Don't come in here. <clears throat> There's no worship out here. Right? Right. Watch this. God, when speaking to Moses, begins with the Ark of the Covenant, also known as the Ark of Testimony. Then the showbread table, then the golden candlestick, then the altar of incense. Then he brings them to the altar outside the tabernacle and its utensils. This is called the laver. This is God's progression towards man. God making a way from where he's at to where fallen man is. He's making a way. Right? Right. Why did God give the pieces to Moses in this order? Because this is God's progression to fallen man. This is God's grace by him making a way for sinful man to be able, for sinful mankind. This is his progression toward us the, so that he could show us the way. The way. You know what's pretty funny about that? The first thing the church was called in the New Covenant was the way. That's right. Are you following the way? <laughs> this is the way. That's right. The truth and the life. No one can get to the Father except through Him. Wow, we'll get to that. Watch this. No one can get to the Father except through Him. The way. His way. The pattern. Nobody can get around it. Nobody. That's why Jesus in John 10 stood up at the door of the temple. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the door. No one. He's standing at the temple in front of, in front of the big door. I am the door. No one can get to the Father except through me. The Ark of the Covenant's behind him. Right? Right. They want to kill him. He's making himself one with God. But actually, he is the ark. The ark left behind the veil is walking around him. He is the ark of testimony. The fullness of the Godhead embodied him, you know, fully. That's right. Watch this. Awesome stuff. So, we will begin where God ended. The altar. This is where God left off with Moses. Giving him the specific details, pattern. How it was to be built. Seven and a half foot, this piece. By seven and a half foot. I made it four foot by four foot but to get it through doors. Five foot off the ground. An altar is an elevated place. Right? We will begin where God ended. God began with the ark with Moses and took him all the way outside to the brazen altar. So we will begin at the brazen altar in our pursuit for the true pattern and its meaning for God's church. All the way to the ark of the covenant, into the holy of holies. You know, it's pretty amazing. I wrote a note here when I was writing this down. It said, God started with the ark. Right? He started with the ark, then he went to the showbread table, the candlestick, the altar of incense, the brazen altar in its labor, the utensils. And this is where he ended last. And guess what? The last is actually the first thing for us. And the first is actually the last. The last will be first and the first will be last. The last will be first and the first will be last. In our pursuit to come into his presence. 
This is depicted, I, I, I'm just going to go over, over and over and over again. Do you know why it's made of brass? Do you know why it's outside? Do you know why it's got horns on it? Do you know why it was elevated? Do you know why this is called a laver? Do you know why it was made of the looking glasses of women? Do you know why it had a foot? Do you know why it was outside? Do you know you had priests that served outside and you had priests that served that went in and served inside, you know, inside the house. They worked back and forth from dealing with the flesh. Wow. What does that mean? To go and inside into his presence. Right? How many of you go out into the field and you got to deal with people's flesh? And what are you supposed to do? Present the gospel. Repentance and baptism. And man, that world will get all over you, right? Before you go into service, the Bible says you have to get on the altar yourself. You know when they depicted the passion of Jesus Christ? It's got to be a free will offering. Why is it free will? And the, and the depiction with Jesus Christ, when it was about to crucify him, they didn't have to drag him there. No, Woo. no. He picked the cross up and carried it. Yeah. And when he couldn't go no more, Simon carried it. And when the cross hit the ground, he crawled on top of it. Yeah, yes, sir. He was a free will offering. Yes, sir. That's why you have to lay down your life. You have to get on this altar. Mama can't put you on there. Daddy can't put you on there. Nobody can put yourself on there but you. Right. And that's where you begin every day. Dying to self to serve your head. Amen. You think my wife likes serving me every day? Sometimes she says, no, me too. I don't like it. <laughs> but you know what? She lays her life down for me. Man, I don't want to go to work today, but the bills are due. I got to provide the house. Oh, got to go work. It becomes something that you have to do and only you can do it. You know, I could coach these five smooth baby songs and tell, tell you you're a sinner, you're going to burn in hell. That's actually putting a, you know, in a way, if I play these smooth songs, you got mama next to you bumping you, you know you're a sinner. The guy in the back with the long ponytail, everybody's looking at him. Okay, everybody's looking at me. I guess I'm a big sinner. I'll come up there. Well, you just put a gun to his head and drug him up here. He didn't want to come up. Right. Unless the Spirit of God brings him up here. Amen. When he really understands who he is and that he really needs a Savior. When he experiences that, he will come to this altar. Right. Himself. That's right. right. He'll come to this place by himself. That's why when I minister in the prisons, I tell him in prison, I ain't playing you no know, two or three smooth songs. If Jesus is speaking to you, if Jesus is speaking to you right now by the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't even need to know it. You talk to him. Right. I'll assist you and tell you, you know what, you know how you become saved. I could give you some words, but unless it's done in your heart, unless it's already being manifest, what you're going through, like it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when Peter preached, it says they were pricked in their hearts, yeah. and they said, men and yeah. brethren, what must we do to be saved? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When they're running up to the altar because they realize that they're a sinner and need salvation, you ain't got to play no smooth song, son. Yes. Yeah. Right. Because you ain't getting nothing. Right. You just got somebody that walked up here to appease you. Yeah. Or maybe put a jot number down. Oh, 150 this year we led to the Lord. How many serving him? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, come on. Man, you know a true sacrifice. That's right. The Bible says, come and die. Right. I like that. There's a pause that you may live. Amen. Come and die that you may live. This is a place of life. Right. This is where life was poured out. Man, watch this. Uh. Take notice to what God says to Moses over and over. 
Exodus 25, 9. Make it according to the pattern I showed you. Exodus 25, 40. And look, Moses, that you make it according to after the pattern which I showed you in the mount. Exodus 26, 30. And thou shalt build up the tabernacle according, Moses, to the fashion there which, which I showed you in the mount. God is very specific. And the Bible says, And Moses did all that God said, everything, according to the pattern that God showed him. Well, I don't think we should uh, do church like that. I think we need to do it like this or like that. And in my church, we're not going to have crosses. We're going to have snack bars. Because we don't want to offend the people with crosses anymore. And in my church, you ain't going to see, we ain't going to talk about sin. And we ain't going to talk about those things. Because, you know, all I want to do is, I want the people to be encouraged. I want to love them. So now today, they're removing the crosses out of the church. Because it's offensive to the people. Is that ridiculous? Yeah. yeah. So if you remove it all, you can't now say certain things in church because you might lose your congregation. Whose congregation is it in the first place? Is it God's? Yeah. Or is it yours? That's right. Come on. What are you looking to build? Your kingdom or his? Yeah. Come on. Come on. God said he's going to shake everything that can be shaken right. before he comes. Yeah. That's right. Everything. That's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah. Being a you know, I told the guys in prison, you heard me say this. How many people would die for Jesus? All 30 of them. Boom. I'll die for Jesus. He don't want you to die for him. He wants you to live for him. That's yeah. right. Amen. Can you live for him? Can you live? That's right. Dying is easy. That's right. I can take a bullet. That's right. right? No. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Peter said, I'll die with you, Jesus, not having the spirit. He even cussed. I don't even know these. Little brother. Yes. I don't even know him. Never saw him before. Peter, willing in his heart. His heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. You can only be empowered by the Spirit. Right. Yes. But they got people who will lay down their life but won't serve him. Right. Come on. You can't serve him without laying down your life. Right. And the first thing you have to do is die to your kingdom. Right. That's right. That's right. Die to your way and submit to those that God has put in authority over you. If you don't do it, well then you're just doing your own thing. That's right. Right? Right. He says, the altar, the altar, and its labor. These two pieces on the outside. What I did, let me not get ahead of myself, I wrote this down. I want to stay focused. Divine service. This is about service. Service that you and I have been called to every day. You're a walking tabernacle, traveling around, traveling around in the wilderness of sin right now, wherever you go. Wow. Do you know that? You are the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God, traveling around in the wilderness of sin. Yeah. Wherever it is that you're at, work, stopped, set up, wherever. You are a tabernacle. You are not only the tabernacle of the dwelling place of God, but you are a priest in the house of God that is to help others come to God. Amen. Show them the way. Come on, brother. So I think it's pretty important that you know what this is. That's right. And what it really is. And it needs to be inside of you, built in you. So that when you're talking to somebody, well, why do I have to, you know, so-called die? What is this all about? Why, why do they call this thing up here an altar? Why is this an altar? Remember in church, I told the, the praise and worship team. They did this in two churches. They had some, you know, yeah. I told the praise and worship team, hey, if you're not dead, get off the altar! Yeah. Yeah. You can't serve God when you're alive. I tell friends of mine, I told John, 
Other John, I said, you know what? You're all right when you're sleeping. I said, you know what that means? When you're dead. You're all right when you're sleeping. When you're dead to yourself. Adam was laid down to sleep so that the bride... Because when you're dead, then Christ is alive. Wow. Then it's no longer about you. You can't offend a dead man. You could spit on him in a coffin. He, what's he going to do? <laughs> dead is dead. Right. And you know what? Your flesh is renewed every day. Every day when you get up. The priestly duty and service in the temple, before they began to serve, they had to lay down their life, sacrifice, and wash before they can go into service. It's called worship. Before they can go in. Inside the holy place was called worship. There's no worship outside. No worship outside. No. You understand that? People can, you know, oh, I repented, I've been baptized, have you went in yet? Well, you don't even know what worship is. Because true worship is worship Him in spirit and in truth. The only way you can know what that is, is if you've had an encounter with Him. An encounter. Watch this. So, the brazen altar, Exodus 27, 1 through 8. It's five cubits, seven and a half foot by seven and a half foot, three cubits high, five foot high. Altars are elevated places. An altar is an elevated place. That's why Christ was elevated. Five foot. Why? Why? Because when you come to Him, His feet is in your face. Yes. Ah, son! The gospel is in your face. You're at His feet. That's why His feet was as brass. The labor in its foot. The tabernacle's a man laid down. And here is His feet. Yeah. Here is His feet. Wow. Repentance. The gospel. Shod your shoes with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is the gospel? That Jesus died and rose again. That He died and was buried and rose again. The gospel. The good news. The feet. Wow. Remember how I told you in the Bible the shoes represent the curse. Man had to put shoes on. Shoes represent a curse. Shoes represent a curse. Why do you wear shoes? To protect the bottom of your feet. From what? The thorns, the rocks, and everything else. Because the ground is cursed. That's why when Moses came into the presence of God, in the presence of God there's no curse. Take off the curse that's on your feet. Amen. For the ground you're standing on is holy. Amen. The very shoes you wear and I wear signify that we... In this flesh, walk in the curse. That, you know, sin is clothed upon us. Thank God when we come to the altar, the flesh has to be removed. Amen. Because it's only what's on the inside that counts. Right? right. Man. The altar is an elevated structure that was and is. That elevated structure still exists today. The altar that was and is. The first piece of furniture that we will encounter in our progression toward God. Toward God. Eastward means away from God. Fallen man went eastward. Adam went eastward away from God. Remember Abraham and Lot. Lot chose to go eastward away from God. Remember Cain went eastward away from God. To move westward is to move back toward God. That's why westward in the west part of the, the Holy of Holies was set the Ark of the Covenant. That's why the river flowed eastward out of Eden to fallen man. Wow. Wow. The rivers ushered out, issued out from under the door of the temple and went eastward. Wow. And if you find that river, you get in it, it'll lead you right back to the throne. 
the first piece of furniture that we'll encounter in our progression toward God, toward the Holy of Holies. The first piece is the place of blood, the blood of atonement, and the beginning of true worship. It's the beginning of true worship. You cannot worship God if you do not understand what this is. This is Jesus Christ, elevated, died for you and me. Horns on the altar, representing power and authority. Why? Because deer and rams ah, had their power in their horns. The ram that was caught in the thicket with Abraham was caught by its horns. Was caught in a sticker bush, a thorn bush. And that's the thorns. That's the power of sin. That's why Jesus placed the crown. They placed the thorns on his head because he was the lamb that was now the growed up ram. That sin was placed upon him. The curse of the ground would bring forth the thorn, the thorn bush. He bore it on his head for you and me. The first place that you encounter when you come in to meet God the first thing before you can ever get inside the holy place. I could pass in front of your house and see what you have in your yard, a swing set, a gate, all, whatever it is that's set up in your yard. But I don't know nothing about what's inside of your house. That's the Christians today will not come into fellowship, into communion, communion, where is communion? The bud and the wine, it's inside the house. How do you come into union with your friends? Come on over, what do you do? We sit down at the table and we eat. How, what is that called? We're coming into union, we're communing together, we're fellowshipping together, we're getting to know one another, we're spending time together. What is a bride? and a bridegroom do when they get married in Israel. For the first year, the bridegroom does nothing. A whole year. He spends that with his wife and they become intimate and all they do is get to know one another. That's what it's all about. Because once you come in and experience him, this is the place of revelation of understanding, of true worship, of wow. This is the place when you fall in love with someone, you do crazy things, you kiss in front of people, you hold hands and you know, you're all googly eyed and because you're in love. <clears throat> That's why Jesus says in, you know, with the churches, the seven churches in Revelation, you know, return to thy first love. Do what you did in the beginning. Or you're just a so-called Christian that thinks you know? When's the last time you've actually came into union with him? And allowed him to begin to speak to you? Mm. It's made of brass. Brass speaks of judgment. The judgment would be placed upon him. Brass, that's what it is biblically represents suffering and judgment. He would suffer outside the door. Jesus suffered outside the gate of the city, God's house. A place of death. A place, it was made of shittim wood, overlaid with brass. Shittim wood speaks of incorruption. It's wood that doesn't see to get that doesn't see decay. Therefore, Jesus was not allowed to stay in the ground more than three days because the fourth day, the body see it decay. He was raised on the third day. Remember Lazarus, my Lord, he's been in the ground four days. His body's already seen decay. That's good because I'm going to show you that even when the body sees decay, I can raise him up. Amen. Right. It was made of shittim wood, which speaks of incorruption. Wood speaks of humanity. This altar, wood speaks of humanity. How? I am the vine, ye are the branches. He healed the man's blind eyes, right? Oh, I see men as trees walking. Wood is humanity. These are altars, elevated places, places that you have to come to. 
Places that I as a priest and you as a priest in the house of God is only there to assist those that are coming to lay their life down. The priest didn't play smooth songs or whatever it was for those that were out there and call them to come. No! It had to be free will. When they came, man, there was assistance. The bride. Here, let me give you another one. Do you know why they were called Levites? Check this out. The word Levi is derived from Matthew. Matthew is Levi. Levi's name means joined. Ooh, and these two shall be joined together. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. The priests that served in the house of God were considered brides because they were joined to God. Levi. Wow. It's all about a marriage. It's all about you and him. Not you, me, and him. Not you, your husband, and him. Not you, not you, your mama, and him. You have to come into the king's courts just like Esther did. A bride. If she was not pure, if she was not pure, the scepter would not have been raised. Because you see, the scepter is grace. When he raised the scepter to her, man, she could have died. Were you coming to the king's courts? Right. And you're an unfaithful bride? Through the law, there's no mercy. The Bible says through the law, two or three witnesses were put to death. How much more sore the punishment who has trampled the blood of the king? This ain't no joke. No. Man, he's singing these songs. And I'm thinking, wow, man, are you ready to be ushered in to the king's chamber? Uh, I think I need to go outside and wash a little bit more, check myself out. Why? The Bible says the bride, the righteous, purifieth himself. Right. You are made to wash in the word. Yeah. You are made to judge yourself, the Bible says. To see if you're in the faith or not. That's right. Oh, what wow. did you say? That's right. Oh, well, I'm always in the faith because, you know, I'm always saved. No. Uh -oh. <laughs> wow. Well, check this out. Made with horns on the corners. Horns or power and authority. Made to be carried upon the shoulders of the priests. Sound familiar? Who carried it? Jesus. Right? Placed outside the tent of meeting. Where is it at? It's outside the tent of meeting. What does that mean? That means this. No meeting here. <laughs> meeting right here. <laughs> no meeting out here. This is where the gospel, which is a wedding proposal, is proposed to you and me. If you do this, then I will do this. Deuteronomy 28. Yeah. Blessings, you'll be blessed in your house and your, and, and, and your finances and everything you put your hand to. But if you don't, yeah. cursed will you be. Right. What? Oh, I'm sorry. That still is in effect today. How do we know that? It's the pattern. How many are preaching not according to the pattern? Speak unto us smooth things. That's right. Speak unto us the itching things that tickle our ear, which makes us go into our pocket and give you some. <laughs> Come on. Wow. I'm going to address that. Jesus speaks of it. 
man, watch this. Man. <laughs> A place where the priest of God would assist and help you in your pursuit to be accepted by God. I just was told, I was just told that this certain man who lives a very sinful life has made his peace with God. Are you kidding me? How can an adulteress or a fornicator or a homosexual or a drunkard deliberately and continually live in that sin and say they made their peace with God? What you made was... A big mistake. Yeah. You ain't made no peace. That is beyond me. And as a priest of God, in the house of God, I am required to tell you what my Lord will accept and what he will not accept. Right. I'm here at this altar. To assist you. Because right. I've been into his courts. I've been in there. He's spoken to me. I know what he requires. And I'm sorry. It's not a simple little prayer to ask Jesus in your heart. And you become a part of the family of God. It's when true repentance yeah. Come on. has hit you that breaks you down and you realize for the first time in your life that you're a sinner and need a savior. Yeah. That's what this altar is about. Amen. Do you know what an altar is? You see, to you and me, it's not a big thing. But to Christ and the children of Israel that's there, they're killing on that thing every day. He's ministering in a temple while there's blood rolling down the sides of the altar. And he knows it's going to be him. Get a grip. Watching the innocents die every day. And Jesus ministering. How he's the lamb. You see the hide being ripped off the lamb? He's in the temple. There is tables that are set up. That when you bring the lamb, the priest would assist you, give you the knife, place your hand on his head. You would cut his throat, hold your hand on his head till he goes down to the ground, takes his last breath, and the innocence is transported, transcended, or exchange your sin on that lamb. Then, what does the priest do? Take your lamb. Because that lamb is you. Yeah. <sighs> Go to the table over there and remove all its flesh and its entrails. Because the priest said, God don't want no flesh. He don't want no guts. He don't want none of that in his house. You go clean yourself. The righteous purifieth himself. How? By washing in the word. Wow. I see. Man, I got to make some changes. And then, when you bring, he tells you what parts are going to be offered to God. After you've done all that you do and you're there, bloody, people in the temple, blood all over them, priests, 
blood all over that garment. Now, you can wash. And you wash the innocent blood off your hands. Sound familiar? Sound familiar, pilot? Man, have nothing to do with this innocent man? Him washing his hands? What do you think this is just... You see, the reality is we're not there. The reality is we're not seeing it. Come on. Because it's all about revealing the truth of it. And the priest would then, after they would place the best parts, then they would go and they had to wash as they look into a laver made of brass. A laver, wood, humanity. Brass, suffering. They were commanded in Deuteronomy 30, I mean Exodus 30, tell Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, do not come into my house without washing. I will strike them dead. Why? Because God. You see, they have the what the sin offering required upon them. They were covered in sin. That's the evidence of sin. That's why Jesus said, though your sins be as scarlet, you can see it. I'm going to make them white as snow. So you can't see them. Old covenant, blood stained. New covenant, washed away. <laughs> what? <laughs> so for them to try to come in without washing, sins all over them. God's holiness demands justice. It just happens. Boom! They having to buy you dead. Why? Because they didn't follow the pattern. Wow. This pattern is repeated over and over. Check this out. The altar the place where you find out what God requires and how the flesh is not accepted by God and true worship. How many people you know, John, that are not right with God worshiping on the altar, on a praise and worship team? How many people you know? You know a few? Like what you said? A lot. They play it on an altar. Place of death. Not right with God. Trying to lead you and me into worship. <clears throat> wow. Ain't gonna happen. I ain't talking about perfection. I'm talking about you can't live in a life of sin, blatant sin. And expect to be blessed by God. Amen. Or God to visit you. Exodus chapter 30 verse 17 through 21. Tell Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar to wash. He says it to him twice. In Exodus chapter 30 verse 17 through 21. He says it twice. Make sure they wash, that they die not. I want to show you some altars and labors in the Bible. Check this out. Altar, place of death. A labor, place of washing. Labor made of... Watch. Made out of the looking glasses of the women. Wow. 
Why was it made out of the looking glasses of the women? What is this water called in the Bible? It's called the washing of the regeneration of the Word, Ephesians 5. We wash in the water of the Word. As we wash, the, inner, the insides of it was made of polished brass mirrors that the women would adorn themselves with. Listen! When the sages say that when they was taken up the brass, when Moses was receiving all the things that was, you know, given to build the tabernacle, the women gave before the men did. The women, they came running up and gave their looking glasses to them, mirrors. Moses said, no, because you ain't using that because that's what you use to beautify yourself for the men. And God said, no, that's exactly what I want. Because we're a bride right. washing in the Word, the Word gives us a reflection, shows us the dirt that's on us. <clears throat> Nadab, Abayu, they were, Nadab, Abayu, Eleazar, and Ithamar was required to wash their hands and their feet. Hands, service. Feet, ministry. You walk where you go. Right. So that when they come into my presence, his presence ain't out here, so that when they come into my presence, I said his present presence isn't out here. I said when they come into my presence to commune with me, they die not. Repentance and altar and a laver, baptized, baptism, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the feet shod your shoes with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shod them. Prepare them. Get them ready for when you go out. That's the shoes. How beautiful are the feet. Romans 10, 11. How beautiful are the feet of those that bring good tidings. Amen. That preach the gospel Right? Let me tell you something. When you work out here, this is the field. Yeah. This is the field. This is inside the church. This is, this is the legs and the feet. This is inside the chest cavity where you commune. This is the world. It's bloody. It's flesh. You get around people in the world dropping F-bombs all the time. So what? You don't drop no F-bombs. Right. Don't tell them. Don't curse around me. Don't do that. Come on. Please. Yeah, come on. You're, you've, done, you've, done, you've done raise yourself up on an altar greater than them and you are lower than them. Come on. Don't ever tell anyone, stop cursing, don't do this, don't do that. Be a reflection of Jesus Christ just in your everyday life. Right. Love them. Yeah. And hopefully they'll see something in you they don't see in others. Right. And they'll ask you about the hope that is within inside of you. Why are you not like the others? No communing. This is why you and I... You know, in our everyday life, man, you have to just get like, man, just like, you know, I just got a few phone calls. People calling me up. Man, brother, can you pray with me? This world is eating me up. Put on the full armor of God. Shod your shoes with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's tough out here, son. Yeah. But this is where priests work in the field, outside. We all want to work inside. We ain't even got through outside yet. We want to work inside, but come in in the flesh. Get up there. And it can happen. Let me show you some altars and labors in the Bible. Very important. Very important message. Show you some altars and labors. <laughs> this is amazing. Watch this. Altars and labors in the Bible. I'm going to show them to you in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. 
Old Covenant and New Covenant. Altars and labors. The pattern is the same every time. Watch this. And this one you can't clearly see unless you have some kind of insight. But I'm going to say it. Um, God making a sacrifice for Adam and Eve. Clothing them with skins. That was at the Jordan. I know it's not plain as day. You know, uh, I taught you guys on it. Absolutely amazing. You know, the, the Jordan and all of that stuff and what happened, the skins. There's an altar there in the Jordan, remember? Yeah. All right. Let me get one that's more plain. Noah's Ark, right? That was an altar and a labor. Altar and a labor. An altar is raised. What did you say? What? An altar. You had an ark and you had water. How can the ark be an altar? An altar is raised. They came into the ark. Mo Noah was warned of the judgment to come. That's death, right? Move with fear. Prepare an altar. What altar did he prepare? Noah's ark. Right? To the saving of his house. He got in it. We know that ark is symbolic to Christ. That was raised up. And it was kafar, a tone, a smear with blood. There's the blood all over the Noah's Ark. Kafar means to atone, a smear with blood. Here we got an altar raised up, water, altar and labor, blood. It, how, and hey, that's how God cleansed the whole earth. Death and baptize. He baptized the earth, cleansed it. Right? Yeah. That's pretty simple. Watch this. God told him, if you want to say, I wrote here, build an altar that you may live. And a remnant of all the creatures came into the ark and were saved because of what Noah did. Noah built it according to the way God told him. Here it is. 1 Peter 3. Just as Noah, God saved Noah in his eight. Wherefore, even though does baptism now save us. What, right? That's, that's 1 Peter chapter 3. Says it point blank. Connects the altar and the labor directly to Noah. But it's not the actual baptism of the water that saves you. It's a good conscience toward the faith that you've heard that moves you that way. Yes. Watch this. We got some really good ones here. It's going to blow your doors off. Check this out. The call is to come that you may die. Come and die. The call is to come and die that you may live. Egypt was an altar and the Red Sea was the laver. The blood of the firstborn, dead. Bam. They put blood on the doorposts and the lentils of a house. Wow. Took the lamb in four days. Before, uh, before a lamb could be sacrificed in the tabernacle or the temple, any one of them, they had to be brought into the temple of God, examined for four days by the priest before they can go to the altar. Same pattern over and over. Watch this. Watch this. This is crazy. Tell Pharaoh, let my people go three days in the wilderness that they may sacrifice unto me. What is that for? So that... They can draw near unto Him. It's kind of crazy. I'm going to read you something really crazy. That the Lord, I was, when I went to Israel in 2006, and I'm almost done. Went to Israel in 2006. I went to the Temple Institute where all the stuff is rebuilt already. And this is the temple book on how everything happens in the temple. All the services, what they do, how it's done, how the lamb's supposed to be killed, daily services, you know, it's all laid out in here. Okay? You can't even get this book anymore. But anyway, um, that I know of anyway. Um, so I'm reading in it. And they said something. I know I'm taking a little bit much time, a little time, guys, but you got to hear this, man. This is like amazing stuff. Yes. This is a, uh, this is just like, they said something in here that I had to go. The Lord told me, go look at it. Go look at it. Okay. And so 
and I was just going to read it to you guys. But the Lord put it on my heart. You need to go check it out. So I went and I looked at it. The temple service draw near to God. Check this out. Crazy. When the Spirit speaks. If we stop and consider the meaning of the English word sacrifice. Come and let us make a sacrifice unto the Lord. Watch this. If we stop and consider the meaning of the English word sacrifice, we discover a conceptual gap between... We, cons we discover a conceptual gap which may help to account for somewhat uh, of the misunderstanding of it. Sacrifice is commonly defined as a presentation of an appeasing gift to a deity. In the vernacular... Making a sacrifice has come to mean renouncing something valued in order to obtain or save something else. You got me now? Making a sacrifice. Write out one of them big checks. Make me a sacrifice. Right? Yeah. Right? Man. Watch this, man. The Hebrew term for sacrifice, however, denotes something altogether different. The word is korban, K-O-R-B-A-N, taken from Q-O-R-B-A-N in the Greek. Korban is derived from the Hebrew word that means to draw near, to draw near. Come and tell Pharaoh. To come on, to tell, tell Pharaoh to tell my, let my people go that they may sacrifice unto me in the wilderness. Hey, Pharaoh, tell my people to let them go that they may draw near unto me. Yeah. This word Corbin, I went in my Hebrew Strongs because I'm like, wow, you talk about change everything. I go look in the Hebrew Strongs, can't find it. Went under sacrifice, looking under every sacrifice, every T note that ran off to another one, looking for Corbin, 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 Corbin. Can't find it. And you know me, I felt like the Lord said, go look at it. Here it is, the Biblical Institute from Israel is teaching that the word sacrifice in the Bible is the actual Hebrew word korban so that so that so that you can draw near to God ah uh, So, I go all through my Hebrew Strongs. They changed the word to Corbin. I go all through my Strongs and I can't find it. You know where I find it at? I find it in the Greek. But before I find it in the Greek, this is how I find it. Check this out. I told you I was going to address something. Watch this. Crazy stuff. It's amazing. Crazy amazing. Corbin from the Hebrew is Corbin. Q-O-R-B-A-N. Strong's Greek 2878. Strong's Greek 2878. Which means an offering. Literally, it means to draw near unto God. So, I was able to find it. One time in a new in a new covenant, New Testament. Check this out. Boy, when I tell you, Matthew 7, verse 11. It's actually in the Bible. Blew me away. The priest changed the word sacrifice, laying down your life, to the word Corbin which means to draw near with an offering. <laughs> what? What they said is, 
If you're a big giver, you can draw close to God. The word is Corbin. If you're a big financial provider, you can come and sit in the chief seats. Watch what Jesus says about the word Corbin. God made me go look it up before I told you guys this. Because I was like, wow, amazing. He said, go look at it. Go check it out. 7-11, Matthew 7-11. 7 verse 11. He says, wait, was it 7-11? Let me go back. Matthew, I'm sorry. It's Mark 7 11. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Oh, wait, exactly. Mark. Mark 7 11. Awesome. Mark 7 11. Watch this. Watch this. Jesus confronting the Pharisees and Sadducees. And I'm going to start in verse 6. He says, And he answered and said unto them, Well, Hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written? These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it, this is Jesus, in vain they do worship me, teaching for the doctrines and the commandments of men. Verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold to the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other like such things you do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. That means take care of them when they are old. That's what it means. And whosoever curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corbin, that is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by, he shall be free. What? Mom says that is a gift to God. Yes, I'm explaining it to you. Watch. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father and his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. Go ahead. Like buying a house and a house for someone. Like buying. What, what did he just say? The very word God told me, Corbin, to go look at, which they literally said meant to, you know, uh, to come and let us draw near unto God. Number one, a gift, right? To draw near unto God. Through their traditions, they were commanded to take care of their mother and their father with their finances. Right. But if you tell them it's Corbin, it's for God, then you are forgiven of that and you don't need to take care of it. You could give your money to me. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You could give your money to me. It's okay. What? Still today, the Temple Institute will be giving more credit to big givers, chief seats, higher salaries. You know what the word Corbin means? The more money you give, the closer you can get to God. Check it out. The Lord told me, before you feed my people that garbage. Amen. And I'm just about done. If we... If we uh, remember Jesus talked about the temple treasury. Remember that? I wanted to show you some altars really quick. God commanded Moses to build an altar and a laver. Right? When Moses, here, when Moses got to Mount Sinai, God told him, build an altar at the foot. 
he struck the rock, bam, the water gushed out. That's an altar and a laver. Ooh. <laughs> right? Place of death. Moses set up an altar. There's a laver. Egypt was an altar. Here's it. Before the altar and laver is even built yet. The pattern is laid out for us. The sacrifice, the washing of the water, before it's even given Moses. We leave Egypt. Egypt is an altar. Red Sea is a laver. We go to Mount Sinai, build an altar at the foot. There's 12 monuments there. Split rock, altar and water. Right? We leave there. We go to Joshua in a Jordan, 12 stones, altar and a laver. Right? Now, the children of Israel are set up. God tells Moses, build an altar and a laver. That's like four or five times now, I showed it to you. When they get to the tabernacle, to the temple, God commanded Solomon, gave the blueprints to David, build his temple, make a brazing sea, which held 10,000 baths, a sea of brass and an altar, 10,000 baths, with 12 oxen, three, 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 and three, 12 stones underwater. Sound familiar? Twelve stones underwater. The brazing altar. Tell the priest, make sure they wash and see their reflection before they come into my presence, or I will, or they will die. Do you have to repent and be baptized? Yes. Can you just repent? No, you need to be baptized. Oh, oh you do? So once you've repented and baptized, are you still required daily to lay down your life a living sacrifice and wash in the regeneration of the Word every day? Every day. You know what that's called? Temple service. Yeah. That's what you and I are to do. Every day your flesh is renewed. It has to die to what it is that you think and that you want. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Or guess what? No God. No presence. You God. You in control of your life. Right. I can do it better. I know what I need. I know where I'm going. I know what I want. I don't need you on my throne. Get off. Okay. I'll see you in about a year and your destruction. And you could take that to the bank. I'm just repeating what God said. Serve Him and be blessed. Amen. Or leave Him and be cursed. Hmm. God commanded Joshua to build an altar. Twelve stones. Midst of the Jordan, Joshua 4. That's an altar and a laver. Solomon built a temple, altar and a laver. Check this out. Revelations chapter 1, verse 15. Let me just read the scripture to you. John is caught up into heaven. Caught up into heaven. He encounters Jesus. Right? He encounters Jesus in the holy place where the lampstand is. He describes him. And his feet were as they were burned in brass. Amen. Oh. Oh. Because you know what? He walked out what his father told him to. He went through the fiery judgment. What could possibly be said right after that? Because you know what? The brass and the feet, and he was raised up on the altar. And his feet were like fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. What? And his voice was as the sound of many waters. That's an altar and a labor. <laughs> what did you say? That's exactly what I said. Wow. You want to see another altar and a labor in the New Testament? New Covenant? Watch this one. Yeah, this is an awesome one here. And I'm done, guys. I really am. I went to the gas station this morning, walked in there, getting my coffee. A lady looks at me. I said, hey, how you doing this morning? Oh, I'm doing good. She said, you know, I was at church last night and the guest speaker, you know, he come and spoke all about Boaz. I said, really? That's a marriage. <laughs> it's a marriage. And let me tell you something. When God speaks, son, 
It's everywhere. Yes. Today is about ushering us into the king's chambers. Amen. Perry steps out the car. The spirit comes over him in the morning. He gets all dressed up. He steps out the car. I said, Perry, why are you so dressed up? I'm coming into the king's chambers. Amen. Ooh, woo, son. <laughs> what? When God is wanting you to hear something, you're going to hear it. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Esther was about a marriage. Song of Solomon was about a marriage. Boaz was about a marriage. Hosea was about a marriage. The covenant of the, the bride and groom of the new covenant, it's about a marriage. The ten virgins were about a marriage. Solomon had all these wives. Welcome into the king's court. It's all about a marriage. That's the whole thing about getting you married. It's about husband and wife. So with that being said, let me read this last scripture to you. This is like... It's right by the armor of God in Ephesians. This is it. I'm done. I'm not done. I quit. <laughs> I have not yet begun to fight. We're next week, right? Man, watch. Son. Good. Ephesians. Let me get him. I'm going to show you an altar and a labor. Show you the hidden mystery. Show you. Man, it's so in our face. Galatians, Ephesians. Check this out. Just out of that. Just, uh, it's, it's like amazing. God says this to him. He says, Wives, submit unto your own husbands. Oh, women like, Ooh. right? We're learning. But what? No, wait on a second. Watch this. Watch this. I'm in Ephesians, I'm sorry, chapter 5. Verse 22. Remember, I tell you. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. It's all about an altar and a labor. Mm -hmm. Wives, it's all about a marriage. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, Christ, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands. Watch this. Yeah, come on. Love your wives, yeah. even as Christ loved the church. Here it comes. And gave himself for it. That's an altar. Yeah. That's an altar. He gave himself. He died on an altar. Watch what's next. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Wow. wow. That's a labor. You guys, next week, I'll recap just to get it back in your spirit. An altar and a labor, an altar and a labor. It's about a marriage. It's about me laying my life down for my wife. Yeah. Wow. It's about the wife laying her life down for her husband. But when they both are saved, they both laying down their life for each other and for God. Amen. Let's wow. pray. Yeah. Father, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the altar that you've, that you've prepared for us to come to, Lord. Not just one time, Lord. But each and every day, Father, we're required to lay down our life so that we may honor and serve you. Father, help us, Lord, to be a bride that's ready for her king. Lord, a bride that dies to herself and washes herself and 
like a bride prepares herself for her wedding day and just taking a bath and putting the oils on and the, the, the just, just everything, decking herself to be ready for the bridegroom. That's the picture. Help us to be a servant, a true bride, one who serves in your house, one who helps lead and guide and others, Father, to your Son so that others too can be a bride for their King. Father, your Word says, the Spirit and the Bride says, Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Hallelujah.